Just talking in the morning, Joan told you about uh, why um, somehow we need to go to three spatial dimensions, something more unusual, like in one dimension, there's no topological order. In two dimension, there's topological order, but probably not beyond. And then starting in three dimension, uh, Joan showed you a model with all these fractal structure and, and, and all these weird properties of not having a string operator and all that. Um, so that really uh, surprised a lot of people because uh, these kind of um, uh, phenomena was not expected in a physical system. In physical system, um, we expect things like particle, quasi-particle, but the thing that Joan was talking about was like uh, you create some particles, but then individually they, they don't move because because you have to go through the, the, the movie that Joan was showing, you have to go through this fractal structure to separate four points away from each other. And that's basically how, how individual uh, points can move. But then if you try to just, just take one of the points and try to move it, it doesn't work. Okay, so that's the, uh, a very, very uh, peculiar feature which has come to characterize um, pretty much the whole set of what we call as a fracton uh, physics. And, um, um, and, and, and that model uh, was discovered around 2010, 2011, and it was so exotic. <laughs> I think Zheng Han mentioned that yesterday that um, even until now, I don't think physically we have a, we have a good picture of, uh, of what's going on with all these fractal structures. Um, but later on, a couple years later, when Joe went to MIT, um, they came up with some new models. Um, and one particular one uh, is something called the X cube model. Um, and this one turns out to be less exotic. There's no fractal structure. Um, and um, and things behave in a more controlled way, as I will show you. But still, it has this weird property that there are point excitations, which somehow don't move on their own or uh, somehow they, they don't move in the whole three-dimensional space, okay? So in that sense, we also call this model a fractal model. Uh, but this model looks much more regular than, than the original has code. There's no fractal structure. Uh, a lot of properties look, um, follow simpler rules. And, and this is the kind of model uh, I want to focus on in this talk. And, and roughly uh, within the fractal community, we refer to these kind of model without a fractal structure. We refer to them as the type one model. And the one that Joan was talking about in the morning, we refer, them, we refer to them as uh, the type two model. Of course, this is, this is all uh, phenomenological. And if you try to get a rigorous definition, I'll try not to re <laughs> rigorously define that. <laughs> but just that we observe and there, there, there are roughly two um, classes of models that we know. Um, and um, so just to connect back to what uh, Nadi was talking about in the morning, uh, of course, Nadi didn't get to the, the fracton part yet. He was talking a lot about uh, the, uh, the XY model, which is something non-fractonic. Um, but my guess is that for the next part of his talk, he's going to talk about something uh, relate, more related um, to the X cube type of fracton. Uh, where there's um, um, associated with uh, subsystem symmetry, which is plane-like or line-like, not fractal-like, um, and, and, and try to formulate um, um, a continuum theory uh, for those kind of models. Okay. Um, so yeah, so to um, get my talk started and to, to motivate why we're even considering things like foliation, let me first introduce to you and this famous model that, that is now called uh, the XQ model. It was first um, proposed in one of the paper by Sakavije, Joan, and Dan Fu, 2014, maybe. And I, I, again, I apologize um, that I uh, won't do a, a, a good job with all the references. I'll try to mention some of them, but I'll probably miss most of them. Okay. So the XQ model uh, is. Again, a three-dimensional lattice model uh, defined on two bit lattice. Lattice model on a cubic lattice. 
So this is kind of the unit cells, and the degrees of freedom will be put uh, on the edges. And the degrees of freedom are, again, qubits, so two-dimensional spins. And um, the XQ model is, again, uh, one of the model that we call stabilizer code, meaning that um, you can write it in the form that Joel was introducing in the morning, that the Hamiltonian terms will be a tensor product of sigma x and sigma z, and all the terms commute. So, so for XQ model, one of the terms will be 12x around a single Q, tensor product altogether like this, off of them. So the Hamiltonian is even bigger, bigger uh, than the one Joan was showing you in the morning. That one was like an eight body, but this one's 12 body. But it looks nice, right? It, at least it's around uh, the edges of all the cubes, so it looks a little bit more symmetric. And, uh, and there are other terms um, at each vertex. So at each vertex, there are three more terms for the z's. And here by x and z, I mean poly x and poly z. And then each vertex, there are three types of poly z operator, each one involving four of the z's, uh, and they are oriented in, in three different phases, okay, in three different directions. And you can check ex explicitly that all these terms commute, so the model is exactly solvable. Uh, very my, nice mathematical properties. You can write it in terms of the polynomial formalism that Joan was introducing in the morning and try to find out gross state degeneracy, uh, excitations, and things like that. Okay? Do that exercise, uh, you will find, um, for example, if you put the model um, in three dimensional torus and ask what is the ground state degeneracy of this model, it turns out that the log of the ground state degeneracy follows a very simple uh, formula. So it's 2LX plus 2LY plus 2LZ. Uh, the, 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 it's upper bounded by this um, linear, um, but we just don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, <laughs> but you can try to imagine that you might have Is something. Here? Is, what? Have Anything in between? Do you have a guess if there's any other in between constant and exponential function? Uh, well, so there is a uh, rather bizarre discussion by stitching things together at the intermediate length scale, mm -hmm. but that's not uh, physically you would want. Okay. Uh, if you follow the polynomial formalism that I sketched, you won't get anything in between. Okay. 
Well, that, that, so your mathematics has two that phenomena, you know, which is, you know, basically binary or, you know, continuum. So I just don't know where this one for seem to be binary because they're constant or upper bound by expression. Okay, so I just curious. Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, uh, one, one thing I want to mention, just following up on that, is that uh, we, well, Joe already proved that, but generically, physically, we don't expect ground state degeneracy to go beyond um, the scaling, meaning exponentially linear system size. If you have exponential in L squared or L cubed, that usually means you have local degrees of freedom that you didn't remove. You can add some local term to remove it. But, but intuition, and Joanne has proven. Okay, so let's now talk about uh, fractional excitations. So one way to make fractional excitations is to uh, take a string of edges and then add sigma x on it. And then you can see that uh, there, there are a bunch of vertex terms that will be violated at the end uh, of such terms. Uh, for example, if we act in, in the direction I've drawn, uh, then I've color-coded the vertex term. And then uh, with this color coding, uh, the red term will be violated. And similarly, uh, the blue term will be violated. Okay. I will actually, well, in this direction, it's the blue and the green. And in the third direction, it will be the red and the green. Okay. So this is very similar to what we see in topological phase, that you apply a string operator to create a pair of excitation. And that's also saying that this model does have a string operator, so it didn't satisfy Joanne's rule of no string operator. Um, but this string operator is also very weird, because um, the string operator implemented in different directions violate different terms, meaning that they create actually different excitations. So if you try to apply a string operator in this direction, and then try to uh, make a turn in a different direction, then something actually has to be deposited uh, at the corner, because the excitation made in different directions, uh, they are different. So at this end, there's a blue and red, but then at this end, it's blue and the green, so at the corner, there's actually a red and green. So it's not like usually how we think about anions. If we create a pair of anions, then we can move them anywhere on the path. But here, if you try to drag it in one direction and change the direction, something will be deposited at a corner, meaning basically that uh, the excitations don't want to change don't want to change directions. And that's why we call these kind of excitations linions or linions, uh, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Fractional excitations, uh, they only want to travel along a straight line. So it's not, in the most strict sense, a fractal excitation, which is the kind of excitation that don't move at all. But this, this also is a kind of fractional excitation uh, that does not move in the whole three-dimensional space. It comes with some restricted motion. Okay, so this is, yes. Is the number of excitations the same as the ground state degeneracy? Uh, <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, it depends on how you count. So, so for topological order, uh, there's a rule saying that uh, the species of anion equals to the ground state degeneracy on a torus, right? Uh, here, it's more tricky than that. Uh, I might come to talk about this later, but, um, but it's tricky. Uh, let me just say that. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so this is uh, one type of excitation that you can make uh, with um, X operation, uh, but then you can try to also do something with, X, uh, with the Z operator, basically by operating Z on a bunch of edges sticking out of a, a rectangle shape and then the kind of uh, cube terms that you violate would be at the corner. Okay, so this is one of the cube. This is the other. And the third one and the fourth one. 
So you see that every time you do this, you make four cube excitations. So this is similar to uh, Joe Wan's excitation in the morning. You make four every time, except that now it's not at the corner of a tetrahedron. It's at the corner of more regular uh, rectangle. But because it's four at a time and there's no process which lets you do a two particle process, so these kind of excitations cannot move by themselves either. Um, they, they have to be sitting at a corner of a rectangle and the best thing you can do is to make the rectangle bigger and smaller and, and move the four as a whole. Okay, so this is what we call a fracton excitation, meaning that um, individually they don't move. Okay, uh, great. So this, the, the linear and the fracton, the existence of such fractional excitations just indicate that there's something non-trivial going on uh, with this model. Of course, the ground state degeneracy is already indicating that. Um, but beyond that, um, the fracton excitations are not just about the If I take a double string uh, for the Linyang string operator, like this, I take a, a double line, and that double line will be able to turn corners without having anything deposited at a corner. So if you take a double line, meaning that if I take a, a, what we call a Linyang dipole, then the Linyang dipole actually can move in the plane that's perpendicular to the dipole direction. So that becomes what we call a planar. It's, it moves in a two-dimensional plane. So that's less re restricted motion, but it's still restricted, right? It's not like moving in the whole three-dimensional space, um, but it's closer to what we see in two-dimensional topological order, something that moves in a plane. And similarly, if you just do um, um, the Z string operator like this, so you have two fractons stacked on top of each other, uh, which becomes a fracton dipole, and that fracton dipole can also turn corners like this. Okay. Um, so the fracton dipole can also move in a two-dimensional plane, making that a plane. Okay, so, um, so this model looks much better. <laughs> I don't know if it looks better to you, but uh, from a physicist perspective, from someone who has been playing with Tori code and, and other topological model previously, this model looks more regular, it looks more symmetric, its property looks less exotic. Uh, so the hope was that we can make connection between this model to some of the previous topological model that we know and have a better understanding of it. Okay? And uh, of course, um, within the field of fracton, people are trying to do everything with it. And for us, uh, when I say I try to understand better about something, uh, one of the, the key things that we're trying to understand is in what sense this, this particular model uh, represent a kind of fracton order or represent a whole fracton face. Okay, so I'll spend some time explaining my motivation uh, because this, this idea of order and phase is arguably uh, the most important idea um, in the whole of condensed matter because these kind of models that we look at, they're all toy models. They're like 12 body interaction, everything commute, but that never actually happened in a real material, right? Or in, uh, in some, even with, with some more realistic model, not to mention material, not to mention experiment, you won't really find models like this. The, the real thing will always be more messy and more ugly, but we study these toy models anyway because the hope is that they represent the universal um, feature, the universal property or order of a whole um, quantum antibody phase. Okay. And that was the case for a topological order. For topological order, this is very well understood. Logical order. For example, we study uh, tar code and we study the uh, exactly solvable topological order, and with the understanding that they're not going to show up exactly in a material, but they represent the universal physics. 
uh, of a whole topological phase. For example, Torvald presents the whole Z2 topological phase, uh, which might show up in a, a material called Herbert-Schmittide or some other um, spin liquid, right? So the hope with these kind of fractal model is similar that, well, eventually, maybe we will be able to talk about realizing this kind of order in, um, in, a, in, in, a, in a real material, right? Um, but unlike for topological order, now we don't really know what we mean by fractal order. Because for topological order, when we look at Tori code, we know that there are certain key features that we need to focus on. For example, we know that the ground state degeneracy on the torus is equal to four. So for example, if we look at material, or, or at least numerically, if we look at a spin liquid model, we can try to see if there's a fourfold ground state degeneracy on a torus, right? And also we know that uh, there are anion excitations and the anions, they come in certain species and they fuse in a certain way and they have certain statistics among themselves and all these are universal for the whole phase. So if we have a, let's say, um, a frustrated magnetic model, we can also try to numerically or even experimentally, if you're clever, coming up with ways to do that, uh, to see um, the statistics or the ex existence of anions or the fusion of them um, in ways you can, okay? Um, but for fractum, um, when we look at X cube model, it looks tricky, right? Um, for example, if we try to use ground state degeneracy to define the kind of order, uh, we don't really know what we're talking about because the ground state degeneracy depends on system size. So what exactly do we mean by the universal ground state degeneracy? Are we looking at a linear coefficient in front of the, the linear size? Or are we looking at um, this, this um, a constant of minus three? And especially if we are dealing with a disorder system without translation invariance, we can't even talk about LX, LY, and LZ. We don't even know what it means. And in that case, how do we even use that quantity to characterize the universal property uh, of the phase? Okay? And, and, and it's actually a much bigger problem than that because for topological order, usually we say that things in the same phase have the same ground state degeneracy. Because one of the definition of gapped phases that we, we use a lot, definition of gapped phases, is that you start from a gap model, and if you can smoothly change your model, smoothly evolve your model without closing gap, and end up with a different model, then these two models are in the same gap phase. Okay? Um, but that's guaranteed that in the process you won't close gap and you won't change the state right? But if that's the case, then we look at XQ model, we would say that XQ model with different system size would belong to different gap phase. That's just according to definition, right? Which is, which is okay if you want to stick to the definition, but which is also saying that maybe the definition is too strict because if I'm a microscopic creature living inside my XQ model, I have no idea how big the model is, I see the, uh, the bulk physics to be exactly the same around me. And, uh, and the, in, in a sense that the, the, the system, total system size is just a boundary condition, right? If I'm ignorant of the boundary condition, I would say that why do I need to care about that? I see the same bulk physics. I would like to call X cube model with different system size to be in the same phase. Maybe it's a problem of my definition and not a problem of the model. So what we thought that we, we, we needed to do uh, is that maybe we need to have a new definition of gap phase. That the, the, the conventional definition just doesn't work as well. It cares too, about too much detail. In this case, that we might want to ignore some of the details and just look at things on a, on a higher level uh, so that we can talk about something that's more meaningful to a, to a microscopic creature that lives in the bulk of the system. That, that captures the, the bulk physics instead of just boundary condition. Okay, so, so this is what we set out to do. This is what we hope to do, yes. Um, why do we have the assumption that the ground state degeneracy, um, when you're translating a system from one phase to another, it must stay the same? 
Oh, sorry. The, the statement is that if you stay within the same phase, uh, then the ground state degeneracy should be the same, usually, um, before this, this fractal work. Right, but yeah. that's not, so is that an assumption, or is that a consequence? Uh, that's a, uh, it's a consequence of smooth evolving the Hamiltonian without closing gap. And if you require that, uh, then the ground state degeneracy cannot change. And that's used roughly like a definition. It's a not completely rigorous. It's a mathematical statement. Uh, it's a continuous function. It's a constant. So uh, you have to show that the degeneracy is a continuous function of the spectrum. I see. If that's true, there's a constant of the degeneracy. Yeah, so consider everything I say rigorous with a quotation mark. <laughs> <laughs> of a gap system, I think this is okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Um, right, so this is um, the motivation. And, um, and of course, I had no idea how to do this until one day I ran into um, uh, Zheng Han, and, and who asked me about how to put the XQ model on different manifold. And starting from there, uh, we realized that this, there's this, this notion of foliation that actually plays a very important role uh, in characterizing models like the XQ model. Um, so what I want to tell you about is how we were the idea of foliation. This is the idea of foliation. <laughs> the idea of foliation. Um, generalize the definition of gap phases so that it makes better sense for X cube, such that X cube of different system size would now belong to the same phase, which is something we would like to have. And also, uh, it allows us to, to make connections between models of very different looking. So models that, that originally look quite different um, now can be related uh, under this new, more general definition uh, of that topology. So I'll try to uh, uh, show you examples of that. And of course, um, hopefully I will have time at the end of my talk to show you that uh, even though we had a lot of fun uh, with this foliation idea, and we also know that there are things beyond uh, the foliation framework. Of course, the first thing that's beyond the foliation framework is Haas code. Haas code has this fractal structure that doesn't belong anywhere uh, in the foliation framework. But even for models with a more closer to layer structure thing, um, it, it will be beyond foliation as well. So hopefully at the end of the talk, I'll be able to show you some examples like that, just to show you. Now that we know how little we know, <laughs> okay. now we only understand a, a little uh, of some order. OK, so foliation. So foliation, of course, is a, a term that comes, I think it's used in geology and also topology, uh, which is referring to a layer structure uh, in a bigger manifold. For example, you have a, a big chunk of three-dimensional manifold. I'm just drawing a cube here. Um, within the cube, you might have layers. So you have lower dimensional manifolds cutting the higher dimensional manifold into slices. And when people say foliation, it means that these lower dimensional manifolds, uh, they won't intersect each other. So they're parallel. And, um, and that's pretty much it. Then you can imagine that you ask the question of, given the three dimensional manifold, can you try to cut them up into parallel slices? And what are the ways to do that? And so, so, of course, this is a, a fascinating topic in topology, and there are fascinating theorems about when you can or cannot do this. Um, I won't try to go into that direction, first of all, because I don't know that much. And secondly, it's, um, we are a very narrow-minded physicist, and, and we care about a specific type of uh, foliation uh, that, that has to do with what we want to do about XQ models. So I'll just restrict my discussion to uh, the kind of uh, foliation structure that I, I care about. So why do we care about um, parallel layer structure uh, in uh, the 
trauma level, and that's because what we realize is that in the XQ model, remember that we had this problem uh, that the model on different system size will have. So if we look at two XQ model, one on a slightly smaller system size, let's say this one is LX, LY, and LZ, compared to one on a slightly bigger system size, which is LX, LY, LZ um, plus one. And the, the, the issue we had was that even though the model looked exactly the same and the bulk physics are all the same, um, but because of the difference in system size, the ground state degeneracy will be different and we will call them to be in different phases, which is not what we want. So we'll try to find ways to understand what's really different uh, between these two models, right? Um, and what we realize is that actually what's different is that we can just add a two-dimensional layer of toric code. So I didn't introduce two-dimensional toric code, but I suppose maybe some of you have at least heard about it. So just say two-dimensional toric code. Okay. Another exactly so model, uh, a stabilizer model. One of the textbook examples of two-dimensional topological order. Um, and, and, and after inserting this two-dimensional uh, toric code into the left-hand side of the system, uh, what we were able to show is that now we can smoothly connect these two sides without closing gap, okay, which is, so, so the arrow we were originally allowed to do under the definition of gap phases. But with the caveat that we add to one side of the equation something that's highly unusual, something that's already highly non-trivial, but in a lower dimension. Okay. So we can add one layer of two-dimensional toric code, and then this equivalent relation can be established. Is this second trivial? Uh, yes. Um, so let me say that. Um, yeah, let me clarify more on that. So first of all, um, my drawing is of periodic boundary condition, so it actually doesn't matter where I put this green layer. Uh, it's anywhere in the middle of the system. And when I inserted the layer, it's totally decoupled. Just forcefully insert something without any coupling. And then, of course, when I do the, the arrow, um, I'll be changing the Hamiltonian or do some operation between the, the decoupled layer and the bulk. And then basically there's some local degree of freedom being, being mapped together and then will become the right-hand side. But, but the two sides will be unitarily equivalent to each other. Yes, thanks. And, um, and this makes a lot of sense, right, if you think about it, because the two sides originally they have ground, different ground state degeneracy, but now we see that where the difference in ground state degeneracy comes from because the extra green layer um, carries a ground state degeneracy of its own. So if the system is on a three dimensional torus, then the green layer is on a two dimensional torus, which has a ground state degeneracy of four. And you take the log, that will be two. So exactly carries the extra ground state degeneracy that we need. Um, and also, and now um, we can also trace back the origin of some of the fractional excitations that we saw before. For example, we remember that we had uh, these uh, linear dipoles and fracton dipoles, and these dipole excitation being planons, meaning that they can move in two-dimensional planes. And we can, we can trace back to see that these kind of excitations uh, they actually come from the two-dimensional toric code. Okay? They were the E excitation and M excitation in the two-dimensional toric code. And because they come from these two-dimensional planes, that's why they move in a two-dimensional plane. They, that's what they do. Of course, uh, this, is, um, this, is, um, this, this is just one layer. And you can imagine that um, instead of to the right hand side, you can start from the right hand side, starting from a pretty big XQ model, and go to the left hand side and keep doing that. Right? And so, you, starting from the XQ model, and you can eventually decouple 
decompose a lot of layers of two-dimensional Tori code, meaning that a lot of the, the things inside the XQ model can be accounted for um, by all the hidden two-dimensional Tori code layers. For example, uh, the scaling of the ground state degeneracy having, having this kind of form, right, the linear part, they all come from the hidden two-dimensional layers because each layer will give you a, a, a coefficient of four. Um, and then you can do this in x, y, z direction. So that's where the, the linear scaling comes from. Uh, and also the plane non excitations. Uh, and also, I didn't mention there's some uh, entanglement feature uh, that also can come from uh, the two-dimensional layers. Basically, each two-dimensional layer can contribute something called topological entanglement entropy. And if you calculate that for the three-dimensional book, you will see a contribution coming from the sum of all the layers. So if, uh, if you can connect those two theories continuously by like deciding another to our code, could you in principle start with like a really flat uh, X cube and then add, so it looks basically two-dimensional, just keep adding to our code until it looks three-dimensional? Um, 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 yeah, so, so Right, so, um, so this is actually related to something I wanted to, so let me say that first and then I'll uh, answer your question. So, so you can imagine that you start from a big chunk of X cube and decouple layers and layers and layers. Uh, the question is eventually, uh, the reverse of your question is eventually do you get rid of everything or do you have something left over? So, um, uh, um, uh, so a, a rough way to say that's left over, you cannot decouple everything. And one indication is that, for example, you have this constant part uh, of the ground state degeneracy, also that you have linear and fractal excitation, you don't just have planar excitations, meaning that the model is not just decoupled X cube, uh, sorry, it's not just decoupled toward code, otherwise it will be too trivial, it will be not interesting at all. So the model, even though it has a lot of decoupled layers hidden inside, it still, after peeling off all these layers, it still has a fractal core, something like that. So if you try to grow it from a, a core, you have to supply the core and then add all the layers and then we'll grow up. Thank you. Um, right, so. So I assume you'll go up to plane minus three at the point, right? Um, maybe not. <laughs> Ask okay. So, so I assume that's the only thing there. So I assume to be the wrong side. The side. Oh, why, why oh, okay, yeah, I can, I can very briefly explain that. So okay. my very hand waving way of understanding why uh, there's a minus three is that you can imagine that you keep peeling things off. And if if you can peel things until the, the last layer and everything's decoupled, then you should just have two L X or two L Y twelve. But the reason that you have a minus three is because once you are left with one layer in each direction, you can imagine and keep doing this in all three directions, and until the end that uh, you are left with only one layer uh, in three directions, and then you cannot take them apart anymore. It turns out that these three layers, you can think of them as still part code, but coupled along the intersection line. And they're coupled, um, and this is of course generalized in, in different ways, and um, couple layers or the, 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 the string membrane net, um, but this is the, the very naive version of all that, where you have Tori code in all three directions, uh, but then and they're coupled along the intersection line, and one way to say the coupling is that the, the intersecting planes, and they're combined. Or you can say that the, the, the excitations, the, the, the planons coming from the two planes have to be created at the same time. They have to travel along the, uh, the intersection line at the same time. So because of that, uh, the degeneracy is reduced because the, the loser loop um, gets reduced. So it goes from 6 to 3. Yeah. So this, this picture actually works pretty well. We, we have played with XQ model um, well, different manifold as you see, uh, but also later we have put in some defect uh, in the in the lattice, like two, two defect. And we tried to come from the degeneracy and, and and this picture helps us a lot to predict 
for the problem statement journey. I think you already said it. So the, the three coefficients are actually universal most of the time. Um, this, this two must be the focal degeneracy. Yeah, this two is the focal degeneracy that's carried by uh, the current code layers. Yeah. Um, but I'll be careful to say whether I want to use them as uh, universal quantities to, cap to characterize the phase, because um, this kind of depends on how you measure distance. Uh, if you change your unit cell, then the coefficient changes. And also because I want the definition to be applicable to the software system. Uh, if, you, if you can't measure, if you don't have translation invariance at all, uh, this will be hard to define. So, so in the end, actually, we don't try to use ground state degeneracy as universal quantity that much for defining fractal models. Unlike for topological model, which is <laughs> the ground state degeneracy is a very useful. Right, okay, so, so this is for uh, XQ model. And, and uh, from this observation, uh, we made the definition of what, what we call foliated fracton order. So remember that, um, so let me first say that, um, let me first give a, uh, go back a little bit say the definition of conventional gap phases. Conventional gap phases is like you have model A and you have model B and they're gapped and you want to ask if they're in the same phase and then what you're usually allowed to do is to uh, change the hot I won't write that, but that's what the arrow indicates. Okay? Uh, but, but actually, it's a little bit more, more general than that, because what if the two systems are basically on different degrees of freedom? What if one is spin model, the other is electron model? It looks totally different, but we can still try to compare um, the, the phase, and, and that can usually be done by adding some decoupled degrees of freedom but usually we require the decoupled degrees of freedom to be in the form of totally something totally trivial, and usually it's a product state. And just to make the, the formulation more symmetric, we can also do it on this side, and we can just add product states on two sides, and then after that, we can match the degrees of freedom, for example, and then ask in this more general Hilbert space, can we smoothly deform the Hamiltonian uh, without closing gap. And that's the conventional definition of gap phases. Okay? So for foliated fracton order, uh, we need to generalize this definition. And from, from, from this observation here, we know what we need, how we need to generalize it. Basically, we want to replace these extra product states by two-dimensional topological layers. So, so if we have a system A, and we want to compare it to system B, and we know they're gapped, we just want to know if they have the same gap fracton order, then what we allow ourselves to do is to add two-dimensional layers, decouple two-dimensional layers, decouple between the layers and also from A. And then on this side, we also add layers, but we can add different number of layers, and we can add different species of layers, so let me just color it a little bit just to indicate that this might be different topological order. But after doing that, if we can smoothly connect the two sides by changing the Hamiltonian without closing gap, then we say that A and B are in the same phase. And of course, the first motivation that, that led us to, to define this uh, is because we want XQ model with different system size to be in the same phase. And, and that is well captured by this definition, right? Because I know that for one XQ model, you add a layer. You can. You're allowing the two dimensional layers to be not necessarily just torque codes. I mean, allow the two dimensional layers they, to be. They don't have to be torque codes. They can be anything. Oh, yeah. So we allow the two dimensional layers to be any gap. Okay. Two dimensional stuff. 
<laughs> and it got two dimensional topological artifacts. Uh, you know, uh, symmetry. And, and so, so in other words, viewed as part of a 3D system, these 2D systems go like non trivially view them as sort of a trivial <coughs> Yeah, great point. That if we just have decoupled two-dimensional layers of topological order, we would call that a trivial um, foliated fracton order. And if you think about it, if you just stack two-dimensional layers, you already have a lot of non-trivial feature. If you consider it as a three-dimensional system because the ground state degeneracy will, will, will increase with linear system size and there will be particle moving in a two-dimensional plane with restricted motion if you consider it as a three-dimensional model. But people, of course, knew this, but they never took it out to be something unusual because it's just a stacking of two-dimensional things. That's what it, how it should be, right? Um, but of course, now we understand that um, we can think of this as something trivial within a more non-trivial class. Yeah. So if you just have a stack, um, and that's a uh, um, that's a trivial foliated fracton order. And also another comment I want to make is that now we see why we need to go to three spatial dimension um, because as Joa mentioned, there's no one dimensional topological order. So if you try to stack one dimensional chains, uh, not much happens. Uh, so in two dimensional gap phases, we don't see a um, fracton order like this, at least not gap fracton order like this. We can add some product product state, like on a base structure, we add some trivial bundle. And we can just use the case theory to classify the topological state. But in this case, is the corresponding mathematical structure like case theory, case theory for, I don't know, for historical? Yeah, yeah. I need to ask you. <laughs> um, um, no, short answer is no. I don't know. I don't know. But, but hopefully, something like this. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, so these arrows, are they like unitary transformation? All right, yeah, let me be more specific about the arrows since you asked. Um, so these arrows, uh, usually we say that um, uh, uh, one, one is smoothly changing the Hamiltonian without closing gap without closing gap, or uh, we can say that this is a, a finite depth local unitary transformation. Um, this is something related to the, the QCA that people will talk about, so, so I won't try to go into detail. So m me saying one and two are equivalent is a kind of tricky, but I'll just say that <laughs> for now I'll just use them as uh, interchangeable definitions, but once we go to QCA, we'll, we can talk about whether they're exactly equivalent or not. Finite depths, uh, local unitary circuit. Yes? Uh, yeah, generically we do. But for circuit, it's usually hard to consider exponential decaying tail. Um, again, I'm not being rigorous to the sense of mathematically rigorous. <laughs> okay, good, great. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so this, this definition you see that at least it solves the first problem of that we want to have XQ model of different sizes being in the same place, but actually brings more benefits being that we now can see that some of the originally very different looking models um, are, are actually related uh, using, using this relation. Okay, and this, uh, me, let me uh, introduce to you another model, which is in another paper by Zhou Wen and uh, Saga Vijay and Liang Fu. Uh, which they call the Marona checkerboard model. The Mar Mar Marona checkerboard.
Okay. So as the name suggests, it's, this is a fermionic model. It's not a spin model at all. It's uh, degrees of freedom among random modes. Uh, so of course, if you just look at it, it looks very different. It is on cubic lattice with one Majorana mode per lattice site. Okay, so degrees of freedom look totally different. They're not on the edges. And, 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 and the Majorana operator, let me denote by gamma. And the Hamiltonian term is just eight gammas around the cube. Okay, you multiply all eight gammas around the cube, that's an even fermionically even operator then, that's your Hamiltonian term. It's an interacting term, but that's okay. okay? And, and, the, the, and of course, um, one thing uh, that I need to mention is that the Hamiltonian term is not on every cube, because it's, if it's on every cube, uh, then not all the terms commute, but to have terms commute with each other, uh, we can only have the terms on a checkerboard pattern, meaning every other cube, and then you can check that all the Hamiltonian terms commute very nicely. Again, kind of like a, a stabilizer, but this is, of course, the Majorana stabilizer model okay. with fermionic degrees of freedom. So all the Hamiltonian terms commute. Again, you can calculate ground state degeneracy. You can talk about fraction excitation. You can compute entanglement. You can do everything you want. And, 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 and we can do that, okay? So, so first of all, the ground state degeneracy, um, well, the ground state degeneracy actually looks exactly the same as in the XQ model, which is 2LX plus 2LY plus 2LZ minus uh, 3. And I want to mention that since this model is on a checkerboard pattern, so the translation is by two cubes uh, in one step. Okay, so the, the single unit cell contains eight cubes because, the, because of the, the Hamiltonian pattern. But if you take that unit cell, then the ground state degeneracy looks exactly the same as XQ model. And then you can ask how, are, how do the excitations look like? Well, one of the ways to make excitations is to apply a string operator like this. You apply gamma, 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 gamma. And if you do this, uh, I'll try to draw it. You actually violate a pair of cube terms at the end, at each end. Okay, so at this end, you violate two terms, and at this end, you also violate two terms. Okay, and um, so this is, this is like the linear excitation. Actually, it is indeed a linear excitation because if you try to drag this and make it turn, oh, sorry, my drawing is wrong. Sorry, it's here. Because it's the checkerboard pattern for the Hamiltonian term. So at each end, you only violate two of the terms. And if you actually try to uh, drag this and, and make a turn, something will be left at the corner. And then you will make some more excitations uh, here. So this is actually a linear excitation. Okay. Um, on the other hand, uh, we, we also have fractal excitation, and the fractal excitation are just created by doing this, by doing gammas um, on a rectangle at each of the points, and then you would have one of the terms being violated. I will just try to draw one, but then you actually have four here, here, here. You will have one at each corner. And so individually, these cube terms are like fractal excitations. Okay. So individual cubes were like, were like fractal excitations that they cannot move by themselves. Um, but then you see that um, if you put two of the cubes together, they can move as a linear. And if you put the cubes in different ways, for example, if you put them with a little bit of separation. Mm. Let me see if I can draw them nicely. With a bit of separation, and this pair actually gives you a, a planar. This one is something that can move um, in a plane. Sorry, my drawing is messy. 
But this, this pair of um, a fracton, sometimes it's a linear, sometimes it's a, it's a planon, depending on how you combine them. And this is what um, in Joanne's paper they call it a, sorry, what did you call it, a hierarchy? <laughs> I forgot, dimensional hierarchy that you, you take um, fractons and put them together, become linearns, and then you put them in, in a different way, it becomes uh, planons, and so on and so forth. Okay. Right, so this model, it shares some similarity with XQ model, right? But it also uh, looks different because first of all, it's fermionic, there's some fermionic degrees of freedom. And then, um, and then there's this dimensional, dimensional hierarchy thing that you take uh, a fracton, you put fracton, fracton together, it becomes a linear, and then you take fracton, fracton together, it becomes a planon. While in the, in the XQ model, remember that the planon and fracton looks kind of separated from each other because, sorry, the linear and fracton look separated because linears are in the X sector and the fracton is in the Z sector. They kind of don't talk to each other. Uh, while in the Marona model, they're all Maronas. There's no difference between X and Z. It's all Marona operator. So it looks like in the Marona case, um, the, 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 the fracton and linear are more intimately connected. And another way to see their difference is that if you think about uh, the statistics between the linear strings of the Marona model, it looks different from the case in the, um, in the XQ model where the string operator is a bunch of x. In the XQ model, the linear string operator are just a bunch of x. So even if they might cross each other and they touch each other, they will always commute with each other. But in the Marona model, since these string operators are made of Maronas, and when they touch each other, they might cross at a Marona operator. So if you choose the, the length of the string well, then they might anti-commute with each other. If you have an even length string in, in, in two directions, and they, they cross each other at one point, uh, and then these two strings will anti-commute with each other, seeming to, seemingly to indicate that uh, the linear excitations will have different statistics um, in these two cases. Okay. Usually when we see that, we will say, oh, they have different order. Right? If we see that in a topological order, we will definitely say that that indicates different order. Okay. Yeah, but here we're more relaxed uh, in our definition, right? because we allow the addition of extra two-dimensional plates. Now what happens is that this kind of, this kind of commutation or anti-commutation is exactly what happens in a two-dimensional topological order. So in two-dimensional topological order, you can have something uh, that, like a semi excitation. You have a semionic excitation, and then you bring it in one direction or in the other direction, uh, then those two will anti-commute with each other. So this is indicating that the difference between these two models probably can be captured by adding something two-dimensional. Okay. So this, all these um, observations uh, motivated us to actually set out to find uh, the equivalence between these models, and we, we spent quite some time on it. And eventually, we were able to show uh, that indeed, if you start from the XQ model, and on this side, you start from uh, the Marana checkerboard model. And then there's indeed a way to relate them in the way of um, a finite depth local unitary circuit. Um, if we supply both sides with some extra two-dimensional topological order. And our, uh, actually, I think we need to add some fermion modes because one is a fermionic model and the other is a spin model. So we might also add, need to add some uh, decoupled fermion modes. Um, but that's implicit already. Um, so by doing this, we can establish their equivalence. And the key, of course, is well, what are these layers? And it turns out these layers are um, the two-dimensional uh, double semion model. Double semion. And the reason we choose two dimensional double semion is exactly what I was talking about here. 
that because if you supplement this kind of braiding process um, by adding underneath it a two-dimensional double semion, then you can bind uh, the double semion string into the linear string operator of the original model and then change the, change the uh, commutation relation from plus one to minus one. So if we uh, add a two-dimensional double semion, a bunch of layers into the system, then there's no difference between uh, these two sides, whether the linear operator commute or anti-commute with each other. It's just a matter of definition, which one you call your elementary uh, linear string operator. Does that make sense? Oh, it's both doubles and I'm sorry. Both yeah, both of them. So, take, take the order by first add the fermionic zero mode onto the Marana checkpoint and turn this into a bosonic model? Mm, oh, yeah. I think we can actually, yes. Yeah, okay. That would be yeah. cleaner. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So Maybe that's right. what we did. I, I forgot. <laughs> so, I think one of the Hamiltonian terms, you can treat it as a fermion parity and just project on, onto that, then it becomes a bosonic model. But then that's what we So, but yeah. then there's another set of things. Uh, that's key, the degree of freedom is on the edges. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> check for another what is it? What is yeah. it? Uh, yeah, this already, so we actually, we did this for uh, the spin checkerboard first. Okay. Um, and for the spin checkerboard, uh, the degrees of freedom are already on the vertices. So we, um, um, so what happens if I remember correctly is that if you start from the checkerboard and if you, because the unit cell has, has twice the, the size, the, twice the linear size. So actually the vertex is like center of edge. Um, but eventually we were able to match the degrees of freedom. So. Elementary yeah. 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 But, but this is, of course, only required because we were trying to derive the local unitary transformation. If you, more generally, there's no reason we want to match degree of freedom exactly like that. Yeah, so I won't try to show you um, the details of the, uh, the mapping. I'll just ask you to trust me that, uh, it, that it does exist, um, that uh, this definition allow us to connect seemingly different looking model and say, oh, they're actually the same. And we did the exercise for, for a bunch of models and we found that, oh, they're pretty much all X cubed. <laughs> uh, 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 which is fun, but also uh, in a way uh, kind of disappointing because we started from a bunch of models and then they all look the same. But of course, now this has been a couple years old and, and, and by now, of course, we already understand that um, now, these models being equivalent to X cubed doesn't mean that things are, are, are not exciting. And that's only because we were only looking at a very small subset of models. And if we allow ourselves to, to have a, a, a more general mindset and uh, explore more models, uh, then we can have things definitely uh, beyond uh, foliation. Okay, so that's uh, the third part of my, my talk. Are you talking to me up now? Yeah. But I, I want to ask you a question about yeah, sure. creation. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is what I mentioned yesterday. So, I think this is a perfect good question, which is, can you classify fully the correct number? So far, it just gives us only one, which is the uh, F key as a representative. Yeah. Are there anything else here? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That first, yes. Um, um, so, oh, so we have a definition, and then um, the, the first few models we explored um, seem to be equivalent to X cubed. But of course, you can ask, do you have anything beyond that? And the answer is yes. So within the, the foliated framework, there are all the twisted foliated fractal order, just like double semion's twisted version of X cubed. Um, so uh, we have been able to show, uh, these are models actually proposing some other paper, but, uh, and then we look at it from a foliated perspective. Um, and then we were able to show that um, they do have the foliation structure, first of all, so they're not beyond foliation. 
Um, but secondly, uh, the foliated order is different from X cube, meaning that um, you cannot relate X cube and that model by just adding two dimensional layers. And we, we put in some effort to, to, to showing that. But that is not a stabilized model. That is a somewhat twisted model with uh, face factors. I know you're not a mathematician, so is this just a best effort theorem, or you have some universal quantity to prove? What I mean is, you have an X cube, you have another model, yeah. but you suspect they are different. Mm -hmm. But you try your best to prove they are different. Yes. That doesn't mean they are different. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> So let me tell you more about what we proved. Okay, tell yeah, what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the universal quantity, like the like, you know, degeneracy or yes. something. You can tell me that is yes. numerous, you know, cost margin. Yes. Uh, of course, let me say that I'm not a mathematician, so everything I prove <laughs> needs to be scrutinized. But what we did, let me say what we did. So we, we took um, a model, which we know is foliated. Uh, and we, what we look at is actually just the planar. So we kind of only care about the planar in a certain direction. And we compare the planar in that model with the planar in X cube model. And the nice thing about planar is that, well, that's an abelian model, so they form a certain group. And X cube model is similar, it's abelian, so it forms a certain group. But there's also a, a locality structure to the planars because this is a three-dimensional model. You can imagine a plane now being localized in, in different heights uh, of the model. So by taking this group of plane now and also considering the locality structure, we can prove that, I might remember it wrong, but, um, but I've, uh, let me double check on that. But what I remember we prove is that for, for this twisted model, there's certain global constraints among the planar, which you cannot generate by doing local things um, on the X-cube side. Well, the X-cube also have some global constraint, but the global constraint are different global constraints. And because we are only allowed to do things locally, we cannot match the two with each other. OK, that's almost as good as the answer I'm looking for. Okay. What I'm looking for is that you take your full and if all your citations throw away the two-dimensional and lower-dimensional, you get a portion, which is a finite effect. Yeah. And then you realize those two are <coughs> What do you see that is like a part of it, you see? The kind of module or the local thing that's still there. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Well, what I'm, I'm saying is that I'm looking for a proof mathematically, which is you can define your flag the fragment model. And then we know that degeneracy is infinite, but I assume if you push a lot of two dimensions, it will become finite dimensions. Oh, yeah. And then it has some mathematical structure. Um, and then you show that those two models have the quotient which are not like what it up to something. Yeah, this is, this is a great question because the way I talk about foliated order is by quotienting out, plotting out the planons. But then when I try to prove that the twisted one is twisted, <laughs> I were actually looking at the planons. Um, because, because we actually don't have an example of twisted foliated order which look different than X cube that um, when you mod out uh, the planons. If you look at a fractal, it looks pretty much the same, um, at least for the ones that we can prove that has a foliation structure. So we somehow have to go back to planons. Uh, we're not throwing the way. We go back to planons and by looking at planons, we see they're different. But, but there might be foliated fractal order which are already different at the fractal level, meaning that you can throw away the plane now. Uh, we just didn't, um, the, the, the example we found was not of that kind. Um, but that would be actually very interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, it's related to the very beginning about the degeneracy. So you don't like the individual coefficient, but you can now rule out there's a combination of the coefficient which is universal, like once the degeneracy is not, you know, the two-dimensional layer. Yeah. That's, well, that's your much cleaner proof. Anyway, yeah, I, I, that, that, that would be a very nice way. I just don't know how to yeah, use yeah, that. that I will know what, what I should say. It's the constant, which may be tricky. Well, whether it 
that the coefficient, if you take the minimal integer, uh, <laughs> it's tricky. Yeah, I would love to have something like that. Yeah, thank you. That's great questions. Okay, uh, right. So, so, so without going to, I actually don't want to spend too much time on this twisted uh, foliated order. If you're interested, I can definitely tell you more about it after. But I do want to talk more about beyond foliation, just because. Um, showing how little we know. And if we try to establish a framework, um, it's very important to know that um, there are things beyond and what it might look like. Okay. Um, So for the, the beyond foliation example, um, we have to go, go beyond uh, stabilizer models because for, the, for all the stabilizer models we look at, they're pretty, pretty much X cube. Um, I don't know if uh, Joanne has a proof or anything. But, well, definitely not the type two one. Not has code or anything with a fractal structure. Those are definitely beyond uh, foliation. Uh, but they're way beyond. Uh, they're, they're beyond my current capability of uh, saying anything about them. Um, but the, the ones I consider beyond foliation still are pretty regular. Uh, they have kind of a layer structure. And they have linions and planons, so things that are moving a line or moving a plane. Uh, and then fractons showing up at the corner of, of things. So it's not that wild, and they, they look closer in form um, to X cube. Uh, but then we also know that um, um, they're not, they're, they don't have a foliation structure. Okay. And, um, and so if we actually uh, go beyond the stabilizer model, um, um, we have to find a different framework. And the, the formulation we choose to play with is this transignment theory. Um, and I don't have time to give you a full introduction on transignment theory, uh, but I'll try to give you the minimum information for you to, 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 to know what I'm talking about and to, to trust that I'm um, saying something meaningful. Um, so this, this transignment theory, of course, is, uh, we're, we're restricted to abelian U1 transignment theory. Um, and usually it's uh, defining 2 plus 1D, and they have been very popular, widely, widely used uh, to describe two-dimensional abelian topological order. Um, and um, the Lagrangian is written as, um, as this. Um, uh, so this is, of course, a shorthand notation. Um, and, uh, and there are um, um, a lot of possibilities, a lot of variations that you can play uh, with this kind of transignment term. In particular, you can have, so these, these A's are what we call U1 gauge field. So this is why this is called a, a U1 transignment uh, gauge theory and why it's called abelian because the U1 is a abelian group. Uh, U1 gauge field. And one variation we can play on this term is that we can have not just one type of U1 gauge field, we can have multiple of them. And we can have a superscript uh, to these kind of uh, uh, U1 gauge field. This i will, will take value in like one, two, three. And then uh, we can have coupling between a different species of uh, these kind of U1 gauge fields. And then um, the coefficient excuse me, will have, will be like, excuse me, k i j. And then we sum over uh, i and j. Okay, of course the, the first case where we just have one species of the U1 gauge field uh, correspond to the case where this, this coefficient k is just a number being one. 
And what we know about this two-dimensional transcendent gauge theory is that this K, if you think of it as a matrix with index i and j, uh, this has to be a symmetric integer matrix. Meaning that all the entries have to be integer, uh, and then uh, Kij has to be equal to Kji. But that's pretty much all the requirement we have for the transcendent theory. And with a different K, uh, you can always write down with a different symmetric integer uh, matrix, or you call it a symmetric bilinear form. Oh, maybe some people know a more accurate expression for it. Um, we always have a, a legitimate uh, U1 transcendent gauge theory, and, and that will describe um, some kind of topological order. Oh, if, if K is um, non-singular. Non-singular. Okay. So some examples like if K is equal to 1, uh, this is the integer column of uh, K is equal to 3, this is equal to 1 third fractional column of uh, if k is equal to 2 by 2 matrix 0, 2, 2, 0, and then this is the, the torical two-dimensional torical. It's an effective field theory way of describing two-dimensional Okay. Um, so what we did is to take this formulation and try to say, okay, let's use it to describe 3 plus 1D fractal physics. Of course, if we try to use it for 3 plus 1D, we need to generalize in some way. Um, one of the ways we can try to generalize it is to take not just one or two or three species of U1 gauge fields. We can try to take infinite number of U1 gauge fields and imagining that somehow they, they have a structure of uh, being in different layers. And then we can try to um, write down um, a similar Lagrangian taking the same form, except that now i and j uh, takes value in from minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, and then with the same coupling. So now this k matrix actually become an infinite dimensional matrix. Infinite dimensional bilinear form. This is a continuum model. This is a Right, so this is continuous in the plane. In, in 2 plus 1, in the third direction, it's actually a discrete label. This i and j are discrete labels. Like 0, 1, 2, 1, 2. So it's like a mystery. indefinitely. And so we, we, if we are not on the diagonal, everything's zero. And this has a very simple physical interpretation because if you look at the, the Lagrangian, uh, each A field only couples to itself, uh, meaning that the layers are actually decoupled. Right? So physically, this just means that we have a pure stack of two dimensional fractional Each of them is nearly equal one third fractional from the top. Decoupled, not talking to each other. And as I mentioned before, this is already a fractal in a sense, but it's kind of trivial kind of foliated fractal. It's just a stack of two-dimensional things. And now we say, okay, we can try to make this slightly more non-trivial by, by not taking k to be diagonal or even block diagonal. If k is block diagonal with finite size blocks, it's still kind of trivial because you can take each of the block, think of it as a two-dimensional system. So that's still kind of trivial. But we want k to be somehow more intrinsically coupled between the layers. So, so you can just make it, just add the next diagonal. And what we can do, for example, is that we can add one to 
the next diagonal, and because this is symmetric, so we have to add like this. And everywhere that I'm not writing is zero. Okay, so this is still legitimate, and it can, the size can, uh, goes to infinity. I take the limit. Because otherwise, it's too anomalous to be any sense. Sorry, what? The, the two wall, uh, as the size goes to infinity, it really goes up. You know, oh, yeah, this is uh, me trying to say there's pure out of boundary condition, but if you think of infinite size, it doesn't. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, this is the K matrix, and, um, and the question is what are we looking at, right? What is the real physics uh, that we can try to read from this chemistry? And uh, I'll, of course, I won't try to prove anything, but I'll just quote some of the results that we know uh, about how chemistry describes our order. For example, the determinants of the chemistry are the same as the ground state degeneracy of the topological order of a two dimensional torus. But of course, now we have three dimensional torus. So we actually have a periodic K matrix, and then we have close the boundary direction in the other two direction as well. But we can similarly calculate ground state degeneracy in that way. Ground state degeneracy. Uh, and then um, we can also calculate statistics from the K matrix. Basically, here anions would correspond to uh, column vectors. The anion will be labeled by unit vectors with a single one at a certain location. This is the i location. The different anions will be labeled by different uh, vectors. Um, again, my, my mathematical expression is <laughs> not, the most, not the best way, but uh, for simplicity, let me just say that um, these are um, integer vectors and then the statistics, the braiding statistics between the anion label by V and then, uh, sorry, the label, the anion label by I and the anion label by J is given by 2 pi times VI transpose K inverse VJ. And then the topological spin of the individual anion is pi VI transpose inverse the i. Okay, this is of course something well understood. Um, but usually it's applied to finite dimensional K matrix and now we're trying to apply it to infinite dimensional K matrix. Of course the way we apply it to infinite dimensional K matrix is by taking a finite dimensional version of it and then scale it up. Okay, and here's the result. I have five more minutes and I can show you why this is beyond foliation. And the result is here, of course, this um, very nice calculation uh, carried out by Xiu Xi. So if you want to know the details, you can ask him. Uh, so for this, um, so for this, what we call the, the 131 matrix, the determinant goes like this, one, three, one. Okay. Okay, so it's very long. <laughs> Where n is the number of layers, uh, or the size of the matrix. The matrix is uh, m by n. And the determinant follows a uh, a pretty crazy formula, okay? And if you think about in what we call the thermodynamic limit, if you take the limit of n goes to infinity, and this is roughly scales as this. And that's, and that's the first indication why this is not foliated, because the ground state degeneracy goes roughly as an exponential, but the base of the exponential is an irrational number. And if you have a system that's foliated, that grows by adding two-dimensional topological order into it, then every time you add a two-dimensional topological order, the ground state degeneracy will multiply by integer factor. So if, if a system is foliated, 
the ground state degeneracy will multiply by integer factor as it grows uh, in size. So we'll go like exponential, but with the base of the exponential being an integer or, or root of integer, right, if you choose the system size not well. Um, but here, because it's an irrational number, meaning that there's no integer multiple, we can take off this number so that it turns into an integer. This just means that it's not possible to grow the system, increase n um, by adding decoupled two-dimensional topological order uh, into the system. Okay? And then we can um, ask about statistics by looking at, um, of course, the entries in um, uh, the K inverse matrix, and this goes like, oh, I think this only, this is uh, in the limit of uh, large, uh, large system size. Okay. The entries in the K matrix decays exponentially with the separation between I and J, meaning that if you go off diagonal in the K matrix, the entries decay, but they never decay to exactly zero, just exponentially decays. Um, and then it also decays with irrational Right, so this cannot happen in a foliated system either because remembering foliated system So, so the statistics would have at least finite range. The statistic wouldn't go too far once you have somehow sold the, the layer into the box. It won't have a statistic that decay exponentially. That's something that's pretty crazy. I should say that this is not the exponential decay of correlation length. In a generic, um, not exactly solid model, we can have a finite correlation length and the exponential Um, the correlation can decay exponentially. Um, but here, this is, I'm not talking about decay of correlation. I'm talking about decay of statistics, um, which, is, which is a different thing. And it's a pretty weird thing. And, uh, and usually, I, I've never seen this kind of thing happen, unless in this model. Okay. And finally, I have, oh, I'm already at time. So let me just wrap it up by saying that the one thing, that the fusion group also looks very weird. The fusion group is a product between two, uh, um, between two cyclic groups. So this is abelian, of course, the, the fusion group will be a, a product of abelian groups, of, uh, yeah, of cyclic groups. Um, but there are only two generators. And each of the generator will have exponential order. And here, Fn means Fibonacci number. <laughs> Fibon uh, the n's Fibonacci number. So the Fibonacci series, of course, is um, growing exponentially. So the order of the generator grows exponentially with n. So one of them is of order fn, the other is of order 5fn. Um, and that generates a group. And that can't happen with a foliated order as well, because in foliated order, all the plane nouns come from two-dimensional planes. And two-dimensional topological order, we know that all the anions have finite order. They can't have infinite order like this. Okay. So this is a very simple, well, in, in terms of transcendent formulation, it looks like a very simple model, yet it's, a, it's very weird if you think about it from a, uh, from a fracton perspective, and especially from a RG perspective. Because the, the thing we're trying to do uh, with uh, XQ model is basically asking how to do renormalization group transformation. Uh, on the model, and Joven had a had a similar construction for the Haas code uh, that you can ask: What happens when I increase the system size by a factor of two? Well, actually, by a factor of eight. And and in this case, we know that you need to add two-dimensional layers. And in Joven's case, he needs to add some three-dimensional, <laughs> more even more exotic fracton uh, models. But it's understood what's needed, what extra is needed if you want to increase the system size. 
Um, but for, for this one, well, I'll just say that it's beyond foliation. So even if it has a layer structure, you can't increase the system size by adding some two-dimensional layers. And, uh, and just, it just, again, just shows how, how little we understand about the whole fractal thing. Okay, and I'll, I'll just stop there. <laughs>